Stanford University. Right here. Uh, this is our last lecture of the, the uh, winter series of this seminar. Uh, we'll start up again in the spring with Thad Starner, uh, who is the, one of the fathers of wearable computing, mobile and wearable computing. And uh, today I'm very happy to introduce Elizabeth Gerber from Northwestern University. She's an assistant professor of mechanical engineering and has courtesy appointments in like five other departments um, and is associated with the Siegel Design Institute. And she actually did much of her uh, student work here at Stanford. She did her master's in product design and her PhD in management science and engineering, uh, advised by Bob Sutton. And uh, I'm sure I'm leaving lots of details out, but I'm excited to hear her talk. She's talking about the motivational issues involved with creativity and uh, has some really deep insights. So welcome. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. How's everybody doing? Good. It's Friday, the last Friday of the term. I'm honored that you are here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm particularly excited to be here because this is where I did my training. And so what a, what a treat to come back and, and share the work that I've been working on. Um, the talk I'm going to give today is looking at the possibility of technology motivating creativity. And I'm going to get into a bit about what I mean by that. What I want to be clear about is this perspective is informed by my position as a designer, product designer primarily, formerly of toy design, and organizational behavior. And I'm bringing this to you as HCI designers. So what I'm hoping to get out of this personally is some great feedback from you on how this work relates to what you're doing and how I, the directions I might take from this. So can you agree to that? Agree to give me feedback? Sure. Let's go for it. OK, good. So creativity is vital to our economic um, well-being and our uh, social well-being. What I want to talk about today is how is it that we can design what I'm calling creativity signifiers these are things that motivate you to engage with a technology and engage you to perform in a creative way. I'm going to talk about the mechanisms through, this, with this, through which this works, which are emotion, goals, and beliefs. Why is this important for HCI? My contention is that technology increasingly supports both creative and routine work. And so how is it that we might actually start to design these technologies to make more effective creators, if you will? Why should we support creativity? My contention is that there's abundance of problems. We need creative and innovative solutions to attend to these. And I'll illustrate this um, with a quote recently shared by Mick, Mitch Resnick, who's at MIT Media Lab. He suggests that knowledge alone is no longer enough. In today's rapidly changing world, people must continually come up with creative solutions to unexpected problems. And that success is based not only what you, on what you know, but how much you know uh, but on your ability to think and act creatively. Interestingly enough, this perspective is not only being adopted by HCI folks, but also economists, sociologists, etc. So, how to support creativity? I'm going to start with a story um, of how I first got into this, into this topic, which was in 2000, I was working at a toy company in San Francisco. It was called Wild Planet Toys. And here I was um, at the Javits Center. Annually, there's a toy fair, which is quite an exciting place. This is where all the ideas come every year to figure out what toy will be made into the next year. And one of my jobs, a very interesting job, was to actually meet with all the toy designers. It turns out toy design does not always happen within the company. In fact, many ideas are um, contributed by outside inventors. So there I was, meeting with a man, an older man, and. He came up to me, and I'm, un I'm under non-disclosure, so I can't tell you exactly the concept he presented to me. But I liken this concept to giving a child a bag of broken glass. It was not a good idea. And, and this was intriguing, but he had conviction that this was a wonderful idea. And he was so motivated to communicate this to me. And there was this moment when I said, what? Just tell me more about this. Right? Help me to understand what this is about. And he said, my granddaughter loves this. And that was a pivotal moment for me, because right then I realized that the, his daughter, his granddaughter rather, had received this idea with great enthusiasm. And that gave him the conviction to pursue this as a toy, right? And motivated traveling from, I believe he was in the LA area at the time, traveling to the Javits Center. Now, let's contrast this to another experience. 
I was in San Mateo, this is again in 2000, working with some 10 year olds on this product that was actually very cool. It's called Radio DJ. Um, what it allowed you to do is uh, transmit your voice to an actual radio station, 1610. It was very cool, it was very exciting. And we're working with these kids and we're talking about this idea and um, one kid, most, most of the children were excited, but one kid said, mm, I don't know, it's just not how I work. I said, what do you mean how you work? What, what, what's the matter? He said, it's a tape cassette. Do you see this? This is in 2000. He said, it's a tape cassette. I listen to CDs. And I said, okay, fair enough. Well, how would we modify this design? Uh, I, I can't do that. Like, he, he, why not? You, how would you modify this design? And it was actually, Professionally, an interesting moment for me, which I realized I was both a designer and an educator, right? Because my job would have been just to write down the suggestion, but instead I was engaging him and said, well, how would you do this? And he said, no, it's not, I don't, I can't design toys. And I said, yes, you can. In fact, you are by participating in this process. And the, just that conversation transformed his notion of what he could do. And once I sort of told him that he was capable, he, he came up with the obvious solution, right? Which was a jack kind of an input device on the side, right? Pretty, pretty, it's pretty standard. So this was, um, these, the story was just a way of illustrating my initial interest in what, what is it that motivates people to understand that they can participate in uh, the creative process. So with this intention, I went into design school and what I learned with the idea of creating tools, I actually thought I was going to be a toy designer, it's still at this point. Um, what I thought I was doing in design was talking about artifacts, it turns out Design is mostly about consequences. And my understanding at that time, going through the process, is the consequence I was interested in was creativity. And to understand this perspective in the way I wanted to understand it, I needed to do a doctoral degree, spend five years of my life understanding the organizational principles around creativity. So the work that I'm gonna blend today is really my attempt to be in this place between social scientists and designer and, and going back and forth between the building and the, and the theory, the building and the theory building. So let's get on to creativity. The definition I'm working with today is creativity is the production of novel and useful ideas. Many scholars study creativity. We can talk about in the discussion section, if you will, what this is, but this, this is the assumption we're going with right now. What are creativity support tools? Schneiderman and colleagues have articulated the definition as technologies that support or that enhance creative performance. So the area in which I'm working on is, is in this genre. To support the design of creativity support tools, folks have come up with this model, one model of creativity, leveraging uh, social behavior. There's a collect phase. In the collect phase, you're spreading, you're browsing digital libraries, as an example. You then move on to relating, communicating with peers, et cetera, moving into a create phase, which I actually think is, is a space typically thought of as creativity, which is the generation of ideas. Um, there's wonderful work being done in this, in this space here at the university. And then finally donating, which is this notion of disseminating results. Let me go back and say, what, upon reflection on this and thinking about what I, what I understood from behavioral science in terms of creativity is, um, most of the work is focused on phase. That is to say, what work are you actually doing? And what I thought was interesting, that perhaps an area of contribution here is, what actually, again, motivates you even to initiate this cycle, right? So going back to the toy idea, what motivates you to engage in this process? And is there something I could add by taking that perspective on creativity support tools? So most of my work is informed by this theoretical model, which is by Amabile and Ford, which is looking at a theory of creative action and saying, creativity comes about through four things. The first is motivation to actually engage. The next one is a problem-finding orientation. If you're not oriented in a problem-finding way, you're not likely to engage in it. Then the third and the fourth are, do you have the knowledge? Do you have the, do you have the domain knowledge to actually pull off the creative task? And finally, do you have the creative thinking skills? Um, interestingly enough, the, one, the, the element here that's most easy to uh, influence is this notion of motivation. And so I started there as, what would happen if I started on a motivational perspective of creativity support tools and started to look into designing them in that way? Motivation is informed by four, primarily by four things. Um, there's emotion, goals, capability beliefs, and receptivity beliefs. I'm gonna go through in this talk and give examples of four projects that I designed, each using those as the lens for designing the project and then evaluating them based on that criteria. And hopefully by the end of the talk, I'll have communicated to you the potential for designing creativity support tools using this model. 
I'm particularly interested in this notion of creativity signifiers. This is building on Don Norman's work of signifiers, which is looking at what are signals that we can design into HCI interactions that motivate people to take desirable creative actions and avoid undesirable ones. So what are, th what are actual design changes we can make to the interface? The broad questions that my lab is looking at related to this are drawing again from human computer interaction theory, design, motivational and creativity theory. And the questions we're asking is, what are creativity signifiers in creativity support tools? So what's a signifier in this tool? What's a signifier in this tool? How can we actually design and modify tools to support creative action? And why do people start, continue, initiate, and stop using these tools. And finally, a motivational question is, why does performance vary in intensity, right? There's different, level, mo different levels of motivation in form, different intensities. Right now, my motivation to use this pad is low. I'm giving a talk. It could be higher at other times. So let's start with emotion. This is, um, I actually owe Scott Clemmer, is he in here? Scott, thank you. I owe Scott Klemmer uh, a thank you for this. He introduced me to Mira Doncheva, who was at Adobe, that allowed us to, to start and pull off this project. Um, the idea behind emotion and motivation, let me explain. The theory is that positive affect, if you are feeling good, tends to make the more cognitive elements available for recombination and coming up with <laughs> unique ideas. So in the laboratory, there's been some really fun work that was exciting to me, in which students were given, or participants rather, many of whom were students, were given candy bars and funny videos. Okay? What did the candy bars, wait, what happens if you're given a candy bar and a funny video? You're happy? Then they gave them a creativity task, a standard creativity task, and lo and behold, they performed better. This was interesting to me, and the designer in me wanted to know if we could translate this into an actual design. So I tried to figure out how to get my computer screen to give me candy bars. That's not what I did. But I thought, what's the, what's the translation? What, is, what effectively is that? Um, we also know from research that positive affect also supports things like goal setting, expectancy, and persistence, which are all necessary and important for creativity as well. So what would it start to look like if we could do this? So let me, let me tell you what we did. Working with Mary Doncheva and my student, Sheena Lewis, at Adobe, we, we were trying to look at Adobe ideas and looking at that in the context of the iPad, which increasingly is a, a place. In fact, how many people show of hands here do some of their work on an iPad? Okay, so it's increasingly become a, pr uh, a tool for, um, for doing creative work. The question was, can we do something, what we're calling, a new method we're calling is affective computational priming. So the study I described earlier of giving people candy bars and um, and showing them funny videos was a type of priming exercise that psychologists often use. Um, you don't tell people, we're trying to make you happy, here, have a candy bar. You give them the candy bar, you give them the video, then you measure affect, and then you engage them in activity. So um, what we were thinking is, could we actually use images to manipulate affect in a way that influenced a later behavior? So priming notion is, do something now to influence a later behavior. We wanted to do this in a way that was contextualized and made sense. But first of all, we had to prove even if we could do this. As far as we know, we're some of the early, this, is, this is some of the first work in this space. So here's what we did. Um, we thought about all the images that we're surrounded by constantly. You're constantly being primed by the images. The thing, looking at me right now, every, looking at the walk in here has primed you in some way. And so um, we wanted to start thinking about images that people see on a regular basis. And we had to start getting we had to get affect measures for them. So we had this fun, this fun way of doing it. Um, these are images that elicit positive, neutral, and negative affect. And many of them we tried to think about what are images you normally might have on your computer, one, what are images you might see on CNN in a, in a regular basis. We had pictures of um, Haiti, uh, the, ha um, the Haiti, um, natural disaster at the time. And I'm going to show you pictures. Um, the next slide, I'm going to show you pictures that we actually use. I want to warn you that the negative ones are really are gruesome. I have a hard time even looking at them myself. So this is a moment that if you're somebody who doesn't appreciate grueling films, it's to avert your eyes while I turn on to the next photo to give you an idea. Um, by putting these, posting these pictures on Mechanical Turk, 
we got um, large samples um, of affect ratings for each of these images. So we were, we were pretty certain about what ones evoked different images. Top is positive, middle is, is neutral, and, and bottom is, is negative. This, this is not, these aren't, this was the oil spill. This was, um, this was the Haiti. I believe that was, I believe that was Haiti. Here's the study we ran once we had these affective ratings. We first wanted to just prove, could we manipulate affect using digitally embedded images? So on Mechanical Turk, we put up um, an image. We had different conditions. Um, we had positive, neutral, and, uh, and negative, and a baseline. We put up a picture of a baby. And then we asked people to generate, um, or the image, the affective image. And we asked people to generate uses for a brick. Why uses for a brick? This is a standard creativity assessment test. It's not realistic, but it's a test that many people have used before. And we wanted to compare the, the data with, with the historical data um, in this domain. So what were our findings? Lo and behold, we were, we were excited to see that these embedded images in the instructions at the time, in fact, did affectively prime people. And that the affective primes, both positive and negative, which I'll talk about in a moment, both influ influence the originality of the ideas that were generated. Um, why positive? Positive, the theory is, Again, more cognitive available elements to recombine. Um, you're also more likely to see, in a positive state, you're more likely to see problems that connect to the, to the challenge at hand. Negative, there's a theory that, um, there's a theory that, uh, that when, you're, when you're in a negative state, you're more likely to um, have an optimizing solution strategy. So this might actually in encourage you. More study needs to be done on this to understand in what context. One question we had is, on Mechanical Turk, you're online, you're used to looking at more gruesome images, potentially if you're used to seeing websites. Is this perhaps what's informing this? From this study, we went on to another one, which is to say, now let's embed this in a tool that's actually being used, not Mechanical Turk, but a tool that's actually existing and is being used to do creativity. This is theoretical. From a designer standpoint, my concern is I want to work on tools that people are going to use. I don't want to create, um, I, I think there's, a, there's many, many tools out there we, we don't use. What can we do to actually inform the tools that we do use? Mira at, at Adobe was very interested in tutorials and the use of tutorials and how that can inform and actually prime perhaps behavior. So in this one, we had professionals and students um, working on uh, Adobe Ideas, which is a very simple sketching application on iPad. And what we were doing is, again, priming them through the instructions. So we give them the iPad. We give them the circles test, which is a wonderful, again, standard creativity task in which people generate uh, um, different ideas for a circle. So you might imagine if you have a circle, you might draw a basketball. If you have a circle, you might draw a pair of glasses, anything that uses that round shape. And what we did was we gave people the iPads, and we said, here's the instructions. If you want to learn how to use the, um, use the Adobe Ideas program, just sketch for a minute on this image. And so in this case, they practice using the tool by sketching on the hammer that's up there. Now the hammer is one that induces uh, neutral, neutral affect. Again, we had different, we had all the conditions again for this. And here are the findings. Um, the embedded images in the tutorial is what we were calling, that used affective computational priming, positive affective computational priming, influence the number of highly original ideas. So more likely to generate a larger number of highly original ideas and the extent of elaboration. What do I mean by those two performance variables? Um, on the left, almost every, every participant had some kind of clock, some kind of sports ball, that's a bowling ball on the bottom, and a globe. Those were standard responses, not original. On the top, the back end, does anyone, can, what is that? Elephant. Elephant, great, next one. And the last one? Right, okay. Hi, oh, uh, copyright, Sing, uh, it's a circle with a C in it, copyright. Um, and then on the right, so that's an example of original, not original. On the right, and the color, the color's not great here, but these are two responses. They're both the same answer. Does anybody see what they are? What's on the left? Fruit, yeah, and it actually says it underneath. Apple, and this is, right. So what's the, the difference between those two? What? Yeah, I mean, it's like this is a whole fruit bowl, right? We've got a whole fruit bowl here, and here we just got the apple. So positive affect, um, priming positive affect, in this case it was the baby. You draw the whole fruit bowl. I show you a hammer or pictures of 
uh, induce negative am, uh, affect through hammer or um, uh, dead bodies, and you get you get the apple. So the Uh, between. between. Yeah. Um, so the implication of this is that we should put baby pictures wherever we go. <laughs> um, and that's the takeaway. Um, especially if you're selling HVAC systems. Um, the other implication is that um, people are influenced by affect. And we are continually affectively priming people. And my contention with this work is that we could take advantage of this, especially in adaptive user interface models, to understand the affective condition and understand the, the performance that we're looking at and how those, how those connect. Questions that we need to continue with this research include, what's the duration of these affective computa computational primes that we're working on? How long do they last? Are there other ways of priming in context? Our next studies hope to, um, hope to integrate them in more subtle ways into the existing design. Because honestly, right now, Adobe is not ready to put baby pictures on all of their products. Um, and then the other thing that's quite interesting is to think about psychologists have a very successful history of priming in the laboratory, priming for things like risk taking, negotiation, evaluation of others, et cetera. And these are all behaviors that are, we're increasingly using technology in these work practices, if you will. And so, what, I what are ways that we can use affect? to support these kind of performances that we're doing and embed them in ways in, H, in HCI. Okay, the next, the next uh, set of, next project that I'll say is working with this mechanism, um, the goal setting mechanism. So some basics about goal theory is, if goals are specific and tangible, our performance is likely to increase. They help direct and sustain our attention towards the problem at hand. And further, goals must be challenging, but just challenging enough. Can everybody think about this in a situation you've had in your life in which too big of a challenge, saving the world? Is anybody trying to save the world here? OK. <laughs> it's depressing. It, after a time, it gets depressing. It's a little too big. Smaller challenge, I'm going um, uh, to impro improve recycling in my dorm. Okay. Smaller challenge, I can probably take that on. So there's importance about the, the scale. Um, so let's talk about how might we inc integrate goal, this, this idea of motivation and goals into HCI. This project came about in a practitioner, most of these projects I described come about because somebody says something, a smart person uh, in industry says something provocative and I think how, what can I do to, to help with this? And this was a director of um, a woman who leads brainstorm after brainstorm in a large, large company, very large company. And she said this, she said, Lack of preparation for brainstorming means more often than not that sessions, brainstorming sessions, turn out to be a waste of time and increasingly even the mention of brainstorming meets with eye rolls. Does anybody roll their eyes when they hear about brainstorming? Okay. This was her, this was her situation. So what is it? This is a goal not met. There's an intentionality for the brainstorm and it's not met. What is it that HCI could do to support the intention and the goals of brainstorming, if you will. Most of the work up until this point had been about goal, about agenda setting, um, helping leaders set agendas for the meetings, et cetera. And I wanted to take a different approach on this and think, how can we actually get the community more involved in setting the goals for the brainstorm and then meeting those goals? One of my observations is, is that um, if tasks are too hard or and too elaborate prior to brainstorming, and this actually an interview with the same woman suggested this, is people won't participate in it, right? It takes too much time, too much effort. People don't have that energy. So what's a way we could get people to participate in meeting the great brainstorm objective? We came up with this design, which is called brainstorm momentum. And the idea um, was to have people do small little bits of work leading up to the brainstorm to the point when they got to the brainstorm, they would always, they would already have, if you will, met a certain goal of generating ideas. So here's how this worked. You'd get an email, if you were a participant, you'd get an email every day up until the brainstorm. So you'd get essentially a series of, um, of seven emails, and they were actually spaced out depending on how many days you had. But let's say you had a week before the brainstorm. You get an email every day that would ask you a very simple question. And you were asked to respond in 140 characters or less, and either with a verbal description 
response or uh, image. So the brainstorm that we had on day seven was how to improve tourism in Evanston. Has anybody been to Evanston? That's where we live. That's why we did the brainstorm there, right? They, people had some knowledge of what Evanston was like. Um, tourism is, is actually does need some help in Evanston. Chicago is mostly where people go. But we wanted to have everybody, that we actually, that's a standard brainstorming task is improving tourism. Again, understand this wasn't realistic, but the goal was to have a, um, a standardized creativity test, if you will. So what you do is you get, a, you get an email all the way up to it. So one email was, um, where's the last place you traveled? And everybody, I'm going to ask that question the next time, and I want everybody to respond. Are you ready? Where's the last time you traveled? Or where did you last go? Los, Los Angeles. Angeles. Great. Great. Was that hard? No, pretty doable. OK, great. Um, now take out, your, take out your fingers like this. Pretend you have a camera. And you're going to take a picture of something that reminds you of your mother. Go. You do it? No, some people could do it. Some people couldn't. OK. Anybody want to share? <laughs> I take a picture of myself. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent, Jeff. Thank you. <laughs> yes, you are a product of your mother. Great. Um, I took a picture of my computer. My mother loves Apple computers. They're just, they just bring smiles to her face. So take pictures, write a, um, uh, write a quick, quick response. Here's what happened. You showed up at the brainstorm, and there are people over on that side. There's a whiteboard over on that side. And here is the image, the collection of all the responses. So up until this point, everything was anonymous. You actually didn't see the collection of responses. You show up, and they're all on the board. Here's what happened. It started off organized by topic. So what is something that reminds you of tourism? Uh, what do you consider a good vacation? People walked into the room. And then next to, the, um, next to the blank whiteboard, they also had this, this screen. And what would happen during the course of the brainstorm is they'd start to move these around and reference them in the conversation that they were having. So they both, they both informed the content of the brainstorm. But more importantly, what I was really interested in was the, um, the task focus and the, the sense of accomplishment that occurred during the, the brainstorming. So the findings from this, interestingly, were that the visualization of this pre-work and this goal setting, if you will, actually influenced the focus and the, um, the focus and the trends towards uh, idea generation. So there's more spent time, more time spent generating the ideas and less on sharing elaborate stories. Have, has anybody ever been in a brainstorm where somebody insists on telling you the entire story of their trip to Florida, yes? And does it sometimes take away from the time spent idea generating? Thank you, I'm seeing nodding heads. So the focus was more on the idea generation, less on the storytelling. Um, and the implication of this, for me, was, was quite interesting in that can we design pre-work to these kind of creative sessions that's compelling and enjoyable? Most people reflected that it was a fun game. They looked forward to seeing what other people had responded. And most interestingly to me, the novices who came into this brainstorming, that is novices, who, novices at brainstorming, really enjoyed that um, the, the status differential between idea generated, they all started off on the same page. So that is to say, everybody already before they walked in the door had already contributed an idea, right? And so there wasn't as much contention about who's going to put out the idea, whose ideas are good. There wasn't as much anchoring around the first idea. So to me, uh, the, the future of this idea holds in actually talking with um, a major S&P 500 company and actually trying to figure out if we can get this embedded into their, their, their work practices for brainstorming as a way of prepping people. They're actually interested in not only using it for brainstorming, but using it for many meetings and thinking, is there playful ways of preparing people before they engage in group interaction, having them commit to this common goal um, in order to generate ideas? So we'll see we'll more work on that. The last, um, the last two projects have to do with receptivity and capability beliefs. Receptivity beliefs are the notion that I believe that my idea will be received by others. Capability beliefs is I believe I can do it. And these two elements are actually very critical for leading and informing creative action. So in addition to informing creative action, they also have these other influences, which are actually quite, um, quite important. One, of, one is that 
Beliefs inf influence goals people set. They influence their willingness to take on more challenging work, their persistence, and probably the last two are particularly in this, uh, interesting in this group. They're actually, beliefs influence use of the internet and use of computers. So understanding people's conception of their relationship to their creativity support tool will actually influence the use of that tool. Now there's three ways um, by Bandura, who is here, is wonderful, done some wonderful works on beliefs of influencing and building beliefs. The first one is just to do it, and this is actually the most effective one. The most effective way of knowing, of, of building beliefs about whether I can ski or not is to start skiing. Um, another one is to see somebody else doing it. If I see my sister doing it, I have, a, I have a contention that perhaps I can do it as well. And then the third one is be persuaded by somebody else that I can do it. So I'm told by a friend, I can ski, just give it a try. You can ski, just give it a try. Um, the question was, what are the ways of actually integrating this into the technologies and tools that we design, right? I talked with some students about this earlier in a little, in a little way. The, the project you're working on with the, the web interfaces is you're, you're trying to show that other people have done this. Is there a way that I can do it too? Now the interesting thing about others, the vicarious learning, is that the other needs to appear close enough to you, right? If, um, if I learned that uh, Michael Jordan learned how to ski the other day, I don't, I don't relate to Michael Jordan that well. I, he's much taller than I am. He's more athletic. It might be a farther jump. So it's important, that's an important part to keep in mind. So let me, let me describe um, what it might mean to design tools that build capability and receptivity beliefs. Again, very different than our typical designing tools to increase functionality, inc designing tools to increase usability. Um, I'm going to do this by describing a program which is called Design for America. It's a, <coughs> it's a, it's an, a new initiative in which I'm part of with some wonderful students at Northwestern. And the goal is to create a network of students who believe in their ability to make social impact uh, and local impact. So this is very much, I'm very much embedded in this. This is, um, and I want to acknowledge this, this is a teaching initiative here. Um, the goal is to um, have students working on local and social projects. So as a very concrete example, this team right here is generating ideas for hand hygiene for a local hospital. Um, the idea behind local is that they can go there regularly, they can test their ideas, they can see what's happening, and they can come back. This was a year ago. These students now have a patent pending, and they've sold the patent to a manufacturer. These are tw they're 20 juniors and sophomores in this picture. Um, Quite exciting, quite exciting program. Here's the kind of things that people say after six weeks involvement in this program. I'm not afraid to fail anymore. I'm no longer st satisfied with the status quo. Design for America makes you aware that you have the potential to change things. You have the ability to act. We just didn't create dialogue about so a social issue. We actually did something about it. I had the desire to help, but the scale of my impact increased dramatically with Design for America. Interesting outcomes. Here's the question that I was looking at. When students give presentations about their work for this program, here's who they say their corporate sponsors are. Literally. They say, here are our corporate sponsors. This was really interesting to me. These are your corporate sponsors? What does that mean? These people are not paying us money. Um, this, there's no money coming into this. What does that mean? These are your corporate sponsors. Here's how one student used technology to build capability and receptivity beliefs to his work. Here's his Facebook page. Here's the, um, next I'm going to show you the video he made. He is um, about this project, design project he worked on, when he went home for Christmas break for one week in Turkey after having participated in Design for America. He went home and he did this project. A little background on this man. His name is Mert Ursuri. He's a junior in industrial engineering, no film training. And this is the video he made. Hello, my name is Mert, and I'm from Istanbul. And this is a küfe. It is the basket used by hamals, the porters in Turkey. Everybody knows what a küfe is, and everybody knows who a hamal is around here. They usually work in weekly farmers markets and help women carry their groceries. They roughly make five to ten dollars per hour for hard physical labor. Most of them have scars on their shoulders and chronic back pain. This is a picture from the 1800s. This is a picture I took. I've lived across a farmer's market until I went away to college, 
and it never struck me that Hamas were carrying kufas on their backs. When I asked one about this, Yashar simply replied, because that's the way we do things around here. So I've called a few friends and started a project. How do we co-create a better kufa with Hamas? With materials that can be found in every farmer's market, that doesn't cost more than $10. So simple that it can be copied by other Hamas. Like this. In a week, we changed something that hadn't been changed for centuries. This was around the corner from my house, waiting to be noticed. What's around the corner from you, America? So here's what's interesting to me about this. He posted this on Facebook, and it went viral. The comments he got back on his Facebook came from everybody from former professors, his friends, and his mother, Jeff, was on there. And what's really interesting to me is that I think what he meant by Facebook is my corporate sponsor is that I'm able to post the work that I'm doing on there and get immediate feedback on the impact of my work to other people. Now, I think what he was doing, it was doing vicarious learning. I think he actually was inspiring by capturing this. He was inspiring other people to do this. My observation in teaching is that the demand for immediate impact on creative action is becoming shorter and shorter and shorter. Whereas it used to be this conception that you would create something and sometime in the future you would see the impact of your creative action. The demand is coming shorter and shorter. And the shorter, the lengthening, that span shortening influences the way that we believe about ourselves. So if we send out an idea and we get, we get a reception right away, this influences, influences our notion of self. So what I've been doing is trying to understand what are the principles of use for and design for this Design for America program, but also the media use. And what I'm finding is that this is a list of principles that I came up with the Design for America program, but I'm actually finding that in some ways they're actually reflecting the way that the students are using the technology itself. So an example of this, the Facebook uh, movie that I showed you is it's reminding, when he comes up with it, it reminds him of both past and future successes. And what this does is by reminding you of the work that you've done, you're effectively boostering your, your sense of capability and you're reminding yourself what you're capable of. And if you think about it, we all do this in many, many ways, uh, whether it would be with Facebook or um, uh, our, the way our tools are organized and our, um, when I was preparing this presentation, I have a presentation. I can open on my um, PowerPoint, I can open recent presentations, right? It's essentially, it's a list. It's a reminder of all the things that I've done and that I've pulled off. Projects that were difficult that I accomplished and I pulled off. And so there's an option, there's an opportunity for interfaces um, to do this. Another one is the one I talked about was this feeding forward and feeding backwards, this immediacy of the response that you need. Um, third point here is the creating a community of others. By, by posting the video, he immediately created a community of others. Now what's interesting is about, about this is what kind of community of others. So in the Design for America program, we have some people who are acutely interested and concerned with social impact, making social impact. We have others that are acutely interested in making impact. We have others who just like working with each other, and yet they're all organizing in this community. And so I think under, starting where we need to go with some of these tools is understanding by what means are people congregating, and why is it that they're wanting to congregate together. Um, in, the, in honor of time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move forward, but there are, there are other principles that I think we can begin to embed into the technology that will help believe these recept increase these receptivity and capability beliefs. Um, the last two projects I'm going to just quickly touch on, they're, they're in work, right? they're in the work right now, um, but I think they're related to this project and important to think about. And this, the, the first one is thinking about the democratization of creative work. As tools become increasingly available, the expectations that everybody can be creative are, are increasing. So we ha now have um, Timbuktu beckoning us to build your own bag. These are all from their websites. We have you know, Write Your Own Blog, uh, Chakri, which is a chocolate company, invites us to design your own chocolate bar, and Muesli is mingle your own Muesli. Right? There's these calls to action to be creative. So the notion is creativity is no longer in the domain of the graphic designers and the product designers. More and more people are doing it. So what I'm doing is looking at, in addition to building creativity support tools, also looking at what are the creativity signifiers that are existing, being used here. And I'll just take a moment um, to ask you, this is a, on the far left, this is, this is a website for creating your own t-shirt. We have um, 
this is Adidas for making your own shoes, and then a chocolate bar. And I'm just, I'd love to get your feedback here on what kind of design elements do you think that they're using to motivate you to engage in their, in their customization services? Any, any insights here? Any things that strike you? Yeah. The red button, like it's bright and clear. Okay. And so what, by what mechanism do you think it's working? What does that do? I mean, it's kind of directing your attention towards the actionable report. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. I think the, uh, the key here is that there are very few steps. So mm -hmm. there's one, two, three here, and three check marks on that side. Mm -hmm. And you can immediately see the result of, of what happens after you click that red button, or mm -hmm. what happens after you go through these three steps. You end up looking like that, or mm -hmm. uh, equivalently, you end up with a shoe which looks like one of those nine. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's basically uh, instant gratification, even if you're not getting the shoes instantly. Mm -hmm. You get some sort of gratification ahead of the actual product, mm -hmm. which I think is. Do you believe you can do it? Uh, which part? <laughs> Make this t-shirt? Sure, yeah. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. Oh, I, what I really like about it is the fact that it limits it limits you mm -hmm. severely. I always find I'm most creative when I limit myself I right. like as much as possible. So when I look at something like this, there's only a certain amount of models, there's only a certain uh, color choice there. Mm -hmm. Like they were saying uh, before, like the three steps with the t-shirt, with the chocolate bar. Mm -hmm. I mean, a chocolate bar is sort of a chocolate bar. So far, from them, their standpoint, it's really smart to make it as abstract and as sort of minimal as possible to ease their processing and to deliver mm -hmm. to you and sort of put the heavy lifting on your side to say, hey, do what you want with it. And then when you have a personal touch and you feel like you've created it, you enjoy it and you like it more. Mm -hmm. Um, and you're probably motivated to gift a little bit more too to other people. Right. Well, so you brought up a, a really interesting point about this, this industry of customization services, which is the operations point and the back end, right? And how much, how much variance do you actually want to give? And what is, um, it's interesting the way you described it is the control was in the designer and actually other people have looked at the same thing and said the controller, the control is in the manufacturer, right? They're, they're grossly limiting. So one thing that brings, that this work has brought up for us is thinking about in creativity support tools um, creativity is in the eye of the beholder and, and thinking about perception of creative action is very important in all, all this and people's extent, um, the extent to which they feel like they need no constraints or constraints is, is quite interesting. The other project um, that we're working on right now that's um, coming up quite a bit is this um, idea, this is a student, Hannah Chung, who got very interested in crowdfunding. This is a Kickstarter is a program that allows you to do basically microfinance for creative projects. And what's interesting to me about this, and she's been interviewing all sorts of people who have raised money from $3,000 to $300,000 in a period typically of 10 to 90 days. And they raise funds for things such as um, performances, product design. There's a very popular um, iPad, or uh, rather um, Nano, Nano watch that just came out. Does every people know about this? Is actually the watch that holds that. Um, very, very interesting. And what's what's particularly curious to me, I I didn't intend to get into the space, but the sign the creativity signifier for me here, one of the most important ones, are these numbers on the right. On the top right, what you see is you post your video of your work and you do a little description. And then the top right, you have um, the number of the number of um, pledges that you have over here. The quantity, the dollar amount, and then the, th then the third number, that 56 number, is the days you have remaining. And what's particularly interesting to me is that as a quantification of the receptivity of your idea. And I think in creative work, we don't always have this kind of numerical uh, reaction, if you will. In doing some of this research that we're, that we're working on right, right now, we came across Craig Maud's website. He's a man who published a book on, on um, on using Kickstarter funds. And he wrote something really interesting to me. Here's a, and then he wrote a blog about how to do it. And here's what he wrote on his blog. He wrote, in April 2010, my co-author Ashley Rawlings and I used community fundraising to raise nearly $24,000 to breathe new life into our book. Breathe new life, right? So he needed this motivation to continue this. My goal here is to outline what we did and why we did it and the, with the hope of inspiring anyone with an itch, an itch, a motivation gumption and good narrative to do the same, to, be, to bring beautiful, well-considered things into the world. Now here's the part I like. He says, the story begins on March 29, 2010 at 10.18 p.m. 
when a woman sitting in her Brooklyn apartment pushed the first domino. Her $65 pledge kicked off a month-long fundraising effort that would culminate in a room full of hardcover books. So it was this pledge, it was a $65 pledge that made them believe that this was possible to do. So what are the things that we, can in our, that we can do in our tool design to actually make people think it is possible for them to do it? What we're doing right now is doing some, some service design mapping of trying to figure out what is the process in which they go through to get their funding. And in particular, what we're trying to understand is what's the interaction with technology and when is it important? When does tweeting about their idea or blogging about their idea influences influence the way that they're feeling about their work and trying to understand these interactions. Um, so far we're finding some interesting patterns in that more communication is not always better. In fact, there's a point at which in what's interesting about Kickstarter is you have 60, you could have 3,000 backers, if you will, people funding your idea. It turns out if you have 3,000 backers, you're also doing customer service with 3,000 people. And this is not a typical position that, say, an, a performance artist is used to being in or a book writer is used to being in. And so we've actually seen and heard in some of our interviews interesting reports of how people are actually manipulating the, the interface so that people can't leave as many comments because it's just too much. And I think we don't have... We, don't, we often think of feedback, the more the better, right? And yet there, is, um, there are ways we might want to think about designing these tools for only so much feedback with, uh, with different kinds of valence to encourage creative action. So the conclusion is that if we think about work um, and as designers, signals that can motivate actors to take desirable creative actions, and we think about the mechanisms by which these work, we might end up with some interesting tools. Creativity tools, um, our technology to enhance performance. But in reality, they're portfolio of tools and practices. And so how can we think beyond the single tool, but think within the context of the work practices that we're using? What are the effectiveness outcomes? So far, we've really focused on creative performance. But I would argue, based on this work, is that there's other, other, group or other outcomes, such as group dynamics. There might be um, sharing and, and um, reminiscing about ideas. Questions about latency effect. And then another question is, what are initial motivational levels? So Schneiderman presented this model as the creative framework. They're primarily focused on the actual creative action. The work that I'm doing today suggests perhaps we should think a bit more about preparation for creative action. What are creativity prep tools, you might say? The work also suggests that for a long time, we've been in the domain as designers looking at functionality. What does the design do what it's supposed to do? But perhaps there's an opportunity to look at motivation. Am I motivated to use it? And I think increasingly scholars are looking at this. We're looking at can we design, can we design for pleasure? Can we design for fun, trust? I would suggest that a lot of these have basis of motivation. And by, under, by applying a motivational lens, we may gain better insight. This is the model, the model that I'm suggesting, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conclude that when we follow this model and we think about motivation, we think about creativity support tools, ultimately, um, people, creativity has a personal element to it. And by creating creativity support tools, we need to be cognizant of the emotional relationships that we're creating with the objects. And so as a fun project, I've been starting to interview people. Are co they're stopping by my lab, and I ask them the following question. I say, What's a relationship that you once had with a creativity support tool? Tool defined quite broadly from practice, it could be all-nighters, that could be a, a practice, a creativity practice, to, to uh, you know, say an iPad here in this, in this case. And what happened when you broke up with the object? So I'm going to show you a one-minute clip of a former student who was here at Stanford and is now working, uh, working uh, in Chicago. And this is her breakup story with her design notebook. Dear Design Logbook, when we first got together during grad school, I loved spending time with you. I carefully decorated your outside cover with interesting looking magazine clippings and lovingly doodled in your margins. I was new to the concept of formalized creativity training and flush with the promise that something innovative could be born from your blank white lineless pages. 
Looking back, it's obvious that must, much of the time I spent with you was wasted. I assume that the more time I spent sketching and doodling, the more interesting my ideas would become. I didn't yet realize that interacting with other human beings would get me further along than holding myself up in my loft space with you. You became an unhealthy obsession for me. After school, I dropped you hard. I guess it was burnout. I've never really gone back, though. Maybe someday I will. Don't get me wrong. I think you and I can still have a good thing. I just don't expect my undivided love and attention. She described this as cathartic afterwards. She didn't realize that she needed to go through this process. Um, so that, that concludes my talk. Of course, this work would not be possible without several people that I've been working with at Northwestern, as well as the foundation that I, um, that I got here while, while at Stanford. So thank you very much, and I welcome questions. Yes. Um, so, um, I had a question about creativity then. Because um, all the examples that you present are all about the conscious task that you engage in that is creativity. So, you know, we go in the room and have a brainstorming session now, and here's a class project where we are creative. Right, stated intentional. Yeah. Yeah, is, is that the definition of creativity, or can there be like an unconscious creativity where I'm not aware that I'm trying to be creative, but I am? And um, yes, I think, I mean, I think I've done many creative acts. Uh, many things I've done up here have been productive and useful, right, if we use that definition. For example, my, my mic fell down and I picked it up. I was somewhat conscious of doing that, but it was, a, it was a creative task, if you will. So one of the challenges with creativity research is, yes, some things are intentional, some things are not. And actually, it turns out a fair number of things fit into the task, into creative, into creative tasks. My hope here is to... Um, having come from an interest in organizational behavior is actually tends to be looking at organizational uh, creativity tasks and explicit creativity tasks. It's easier to measure outcomes if, if we have an intended, a stated desire to be creative then what can we do to support that behavior. So it's easier if you're, if you're explicit about the, the expectations. Does that make sense to measure success? So yes, it can be. Yes, it can be unintentional, but I'm, I'm more interested in intentional creativity. Is, is there any knowledge which one is more, where you're more creative than now? In the intentional and unintentional space? Or is the unintentional so unknown yet yeah, that you can't really say anything about it? So you're asking about, is it, just, just help me understand, you want to know whether it's, whether it's more effective to be unintentionally yeah. creative? Like maybe, should, should, should we have design classes where we're not trying to be creative? Because the better ideas come when we are in the shower and Yes, I think, I think it's a combination of both, because it, there's an intentionality of application. Um, so if we think about the original creative application model, you need knowledge in the domain, you need a pro and you need a problem on which to work. So there needs to be awareness of the problem, right? Um, so um, I think it's a combination of both intentional and unintentional acts, if you will. I don't think you could do one or the other. I think we, as human beings, we're not designed to do. We couldn't. I couldn't only act in a conscious way. I think that would be impossible. And creativity is informed by both. Yes. Interesting how you go about measuring creativity because that's one of the classic. Oh, classic. 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 Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. Just, just how do you approach that? Well, it's fun. Um, in fact, S Stephen and I are going to attend at Kai. We're going to attend a proud sourcing workshop and one of the things Mira and I are talking about is assessment of creativity um, and uh, we've actually used so there's many different thoughts on this one is have experts you know. <laughs> so in some of these we had experts um, in others we were um, we had larger groups of people so for example on Mechanical Turk we were playing around this was a fun time to play around with that and see what we could do one of the concerns with mechanical Turk and creativity is the incentive structure, right? There's creativity, typically extrinsic motivation, money, <laughs> is not, does not support creativity, right? And you, you could also argue that there's, in assessment, there's a creative element. And so is mechanical Turk actually the ideal platform for doing that if the primary incentive is micro tasks for small amounts of money? Um, my personal preference, actually, I'm going to cite, I think Steve has come up with some wonderful solutions 
I mean, really brilliant <laughs> in terms of actually getting the use, kind of getting some quantitative assessment in a realistic context. Um, and that's where I would hope my, my work goes more in that direction. That being said, things like the Design for America, we have some metrics like if you get a patent and sell it, we're going to call that creative, right? But there's, there's a question of at what, measure, at what point do you measure the, the outcome? And in these artificial studies, you want an immediate, you want immediate measure. And I think that's where these pro there, there are problems to this. And I think it's the, no, if we could solve this, there's always going to be a problem. If, yes, if we could solve this, we, it would be wonderful. But I, I'm sort of interested in this yeah. notion of when you do the design for America and things like that. There's this, there's this difference that you get in the business world of between invention and innovation. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so the invention is, in some sense, the creative bit. And it could be extremely creative, but not at all practical mm -hmm. and something that could be useful 20 years from now. So terribly creative and wonderful. but. Mm. Not now. Mm -hmm. And then there's the um, innovation, which is it's actually brought to market and it's patented or mm -hmm. it's, and it's, yeah, it's right a success. Right. And there may be some kinds of distinctions <coughs> like that, mm -hmm. even at the more micro level mm -hmm. that you're talking about. Not, mm -hmm. We're not talking about big businesses, but specific right. ideas that they sort of ideas um, and, and to value both. Yes. Well, and I, I, I fully value both, but I actually think we're ch it's changing right now, what we value, right? And, it, and this came up actually in one of these videos, the breakup videos I had. Um, a woman was talking about her relationship with her blog, which she broke up with. And what she loved about it was the immediacy of the reaction, right? It, the, and of course, you can only do this with so many designs. Blogs, you can, you can write an idea and get reaction like that. Um, if I came up with a new idea for a pen, I mean, we're increasingly going towards very interesting new ways of rapid prototyping. I actually could potentially conceive an idea, design it, and have printed out on my 3D printer, right? But, but still, the number of people that actually can see that idea is still pretty small. And am I going to, I can't create it for manufacturer right away. Um, so I think the expectations for feedback on certain products are getting shorter and shorter. Yeah. And I think we're actually, <coughs> in terms of generational, we're, the, the newer generation of students I think are inclined towards going towards these outlets where they can get immediate feedback because delayed gratification is is no longer interesting, right? It's so last day, <laughs> delayed gratification. But I think what's I think what will happen though is it it may influence what we're designing and right and what we're motivated to design and who designs things. And so there actually might start to be personality types of and maybe this actually already exists of you design based on your need for immediate gratification, right? And your pr the products you design are determined by, by that. Uh, just an idea. That being said, all about the products, I will say there's some really interesting crowdsourcing idea, product ideas going out there right now where you post ideas up for a product and actually get um, people to prepay for it um, before it's even produced, which is really interesting in terms of getting feedback and creation. Um, and there's a numerical value on it, right? There's a monetary value, which is, I, I feel like people don't often like to talk about creativity and, and, um, and sponsorship, but that is an indicator of, of value in many domains. Yeah, please. Uh, your last video says um, uh, human face uh, interaction. I was wondering, is face-to-face -face, uh, more important than the online interaction, or you think they are the same? That's a wonderful question and a life <coughs> research that I don't feel I'm qualified to answer. Um, in the creativity space, um, my, my inclination is that people are identifying new identities online and in person. Um, and so there's, right now we're working on this blended identity. There's people who do incredibly creative work, uh, and yet you wouldn't know them in a face-to-face -face context because they don't communicate that. That's a different identity. Um, the woman who talked, the blog woman, was saying one of the reasons she switched, she broke up with blog and actually um, started on Facebook was the sense that her online identity was becoming more than who she actually was. Um, and when she'd walk and she'd go to parties, when, as soon as pe people wouldn't know who she was until they, they heard her name, and then they instantly know who she was. And the, so the face-to-face -face interaction was becoming too much for her in terms of her identity. She wasn't actually that social. Um, and it, it didn't 
wasn't fitting with who she was. So I can't say who, I can't say what's better or not. I'm, it's not the area of my, my, my studies, but I've been interested in, in seeing how people blend these two, two ways of expression. Certainly for the Design for America, face-to-face -face is very important because they're working on social and local projects. So they see these people. Okay, any other question? Thank you, please. Okay, thanks. Uh, so one question was, so you kind of the uh, studies that you presented were kind of different kind of breakdowns to the motivation quadrant uh, mm -hmm. and the model. Uh, I must say that I've been uh, pretty fully following you on the topic of receptivity and capability. But sure. So my conclusion about the uh, study that you presented was that um, it seemed to do quite a lot of the, uh, you know, I'm trying to uh, get people understand their capabilities mm -hmm. and uh, how I see it was that the outcome message was that you kind of have to get the feedback very early on, and I think uh, sort of you see the kind of a, the relationship of uh, these concepts to the concept. For instance, I'm able to use intrinsic and extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. Do you see that they're somehow connected? Oh, certainly. Um, I could have in the model. I could have. I could have labeled it intrinsic motivation. Um, however, increasingly, there's actually some new and interesting work on um, <coughs> extrinsic motivation as linked to creativity. And there's actually, it's, we used to say intrinsic motivation is good, extrinsic motivation is bad for creativity. That, it was a pretty clear line. And increasingly, there's actually some notation that some types of extrinsic motivation can be valuable as long as it's in, um, there's, the ratio is appropriate for intrinsic and extrinsic. So, so yes, I, I guess I was I was hesitant to label in that way, given the some of the more recent research I've I found in this because, in this space. Uh, I, I kind of interpret your uh, outcome as the uh, kind of uh, some sort of valuation that extrinsic motivation is actually good. If you uh, I mean at, at least if it comes it comes in some sort of form of feedback, like you were talking about, like the feedback for designers of iPad two mm -hmm. uh, or whatever technical gadget which is, uh, kind of becomes popular, you don't need to be available. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, uh, that's kind of like a little bit of like contrasting the original views by the yes, particle this extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. Well, and again, I think what that speaks to is, uh, is and I want to link this to some of the new researchers, is kind of the, the importance of, um, of the ratio and also of timing, right? I mean, the funding project is a different, there's a different type of creativity that's occurring at that point. Um, and actually some people, this is, I'm asking myself this question is where does creativity start? When does it stop, right? Is it, is it done when you've come up with the design and the funding is a different, is no longer a creative process? Oh, and, and when are different types of motivation actually important? So I, th I think there's a question of timing that I haven't, um, this model currently just doesn't, is not that nuanced yeah. on timing. I'm not answering. Can you can you say it I again? Yeah. On that one. I think my, yeah. I put my personal view is that um, you think about like a HDI a production of any interactive device or whatever product it is. I think, and particularly if we go to a scale, which we're talking about big companies, mm -hmm. there are actually several repeated uh, what you might call creative processes. So you can actually find creative within product design. You can find creative yes. within marketing. Hopefully, you're with not. Funding. Yes. Hopefully, uh, you're not finding in finance. Yeah. There's, there's and some so types you don't want, right? Like different kind of tasks and uh, different kind of requirements. Yes. And so, if it, well, Wendy was referring to the innovation, which is, uh, at least to me, I can try to see it more as, uh, as a like, comprehensive thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you think about like creativity within design, uh, I think it might be valuable to try to somehow separate it. If, of course, the creativity, if it's somehow uh, like shared, like uh, some of people think that there's some sort of like cross domain kind of capability for uh, creativity, that's probably something that might. Uh, show up in each of these marketing, uh, design, mm -hmm. uh, manufacturing, uh, even in the logistics part. But I think that the, there's a lot of things that have to be kind of done uh, differently because of the uh, kind of separation. Well, uh, I think the software is pro probably very interesting part if you contrast it to your traditional product design, mm -hmm. because in that kind of, uh, for instance, the delivery um, models of software, like like take Angry Birds for instance. Uh, it comes from Finland, by the way. But the, uh, like 10 years ago, before we had the infrastructure, we, before we had Apple Store or Android Market, uh, for the Finnish companies to get their product out so quickly and become so big hit within one year. I didn't know about them one year ago. Um, and uh, it would have been pretty difficult 
But now that because the uh, kind of infrastructure has changed, particularly in this area, they would uh, they had a uh, means to do it. Because if they were operating in every Silicon Valley, they would have had to bring that to start 10 years ago. But now, uh, I mean, the whole innovation environment has changed. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Thank you. And Finland is a great place. Thank you for Finland, Paul, thank you for your, your insight. Oh, yes, please. Um, I guess this is a very straightforward question, but is there any study that shows that people who engage more in creative behavior grow their overall creativity? Um, there's a typical notion that the more you practice, like anything, the more you practice, the more, the better, the better you become. So, but I can't, I'm trying to think of a, of a exact yeah, study. I, I'm just uh, thinking more in terms of, yeah, the team of people who are higher with their creativity, so engaging more in creative exercises. And, or is it something that's like, well, if you're simply not the person who the question I'm getting at is, is creativity inherent and or innate? Um, I, I believe that everybody is inherently creative. And, and there's, different, there's different things that encourage it. There are creativity signifiers in my life that encourage me to be more creative and things that encourage me to not be creative. And you have a life, kind of a, a life of, um, a creative life in which those signifiers are um, stronger or weaker, depending on your, your context and your your personal circumstances. So um, I'm also a mother of a three and a one-year-old, and so that strongly informs my view of, of everybody start, you know, starting off with um, the, the potential and the capability of being creative. Um, I think culturally we tend to, um, well, historically we have, we have repressed that. I think we're in a really interesting time right now if we, if we take the notion of being in a creativity society and uh, the notion that it's no longer the graphic designers who do graphic design. Anybody can do it. It's no longer the product designers who create products. Anybody can do it. I think we're, we're getting into a pretty interesting space. Um, I'll be interested to see if there's a, a backlash at some point where we then start to say, no, actually, let's, we were wrong. Let's turn, the, let's turn the corner and say, actually, it's the creatives who should be creative. This is language from advertising. And it's the, the suits who do the business. Um, I, we're not there, and I'm really interested in this space of democratizing creative work and what the outcomes are. I think we'll, we'll have to reassess as a nation shortly to see if it's really good. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to go back to that first study where your result was that positive uh, imagery, or yeah. sort of getting people to think positively, positive emotions led to better results. I yeah. have two questions. One is, is that unique to creative work? Does it also apply to work that's sort of not defined as creative work? Um, um, yes. Secondly, uh, how can that, how can we, given that is a fact, how can we use that in, uh, where else does that come up, I guess, in the design process? Where, where can you actually manipulate that? You know, you said that Adobe wasn't willing to put pictures of babies in there. Well, I mean, yeah. Their tools. Yeah. What can we do, right? <laughs> um, so, so quickly to answer to answer your question is there's been a a lot of research on positive affect and behavior in social psychology. They're just a lot, and some of the things I alluded to here are just examples of um, positive affect has been in influence, risk taking, negotiation, helping behavior, evaluation of others. There are many other things. Um, so that's to answer your question. Yes, positive affect has many influences. Um, your second question was, how do we actually do this? Is it, right? Is that what I heard? Yeah, and especially thinking about things like the critique process where a lot yeah. of those emotions bubble up. I think there's, well, so what I'm excited to do with Mira is the next step is to do, now that we, one of the things that we, we, um, per, we did not perfect it, but we worked on here is trying to understand actually how to use Mechanical Turk to get affective ratings. And the reason we use Mechanical Turk is because we do use a lot of a lot of people, obviously. So what I'm excited, the next stage, we actually did some this summer, but we, we didn't run enough to get results, is we actually started showing images, um, brand images of different creativity uh, tools. So actually, face, we, showed, we fa showed the Facebook uh, logo and startup screen and got affective ratings. We showed the um, uh, Microsoft, we did them separately. 
logo and startup screen and got different affective ratings. So just get a baseline of what people's affective re reactions are to these tools already and how they change over time to understand where we're even starting from. Um, there's one wonderful study that was done a while ago in marketing of showing the Apple brand and the IBM brand logos, right? Anybody guess on what one had more po had a positive affective reaction? Apple, right? I mean, but, but that, so that, that's, to me, there's an interesting. When that was done. You're right, this was, you're, thank you. Because if I do that now, fine, but in 1980. It was four. just a couple of years ago. No, it wasn't 84. <laughs> it wasn't the rainbow, it wasn't the rainbow apple. Right. Um, you know, I'm gonna, I, it was just a couple years ago, but I should know that. You're right. This, it, that's a great point. This context does. What's going on does matter. Um, so I, what I'm really excited about doing is doing subtler and subtler inter interventions to understand what influences. We started with, the reason we started with the baby um, actually was because of something I didn't get into as much, but on this chart, um, some of this work was, was inspired by a group um, of psychologists um, which, who have the IAPS ratings. This is, they have an incredible database of hundreds of images that evoke affect. And they've tested these with hundreds of people. The challenge with their database, we wanted to use it. The challenge is they don't want to show it to anybody, right? And well, they'll show it to, they'll show it to researchers, but they'll, only if you promise not to show the images to anybody. Um, in a public context, right? Because they want to use the images over and over again. That makes sense, right? They, for their research purposes. So we actually had to create our own database of images that we could show on Mechanical Turk, which is a public platform, right? So there's all these interesting, in terms of study design, we're, in some ways we're going to have to do a lot of, we're going to always be creating new, um, new primes because people are constantly seeing, if we want to work in the real world, <laughs> because people are constantly seeing things and priming um, typically, uh, what do I want to say about that? Well, this is actually one of the challenges and interesting of priming is what's the effectiveness over time of a prime, right? If you're constantly exposed to it, is it, does it prime in the, the, the same, wear off. the wear off? So the latent, I think we need to understand that, that piece of it. So I'm, I just feel like it opens up this whole window of things that we could, we could potentially do to, under, to understand. Yeah? Oh, we actually have to end, sorry. Oh, two no, five, quick question. Two or six. You want to ask a question real quick and then maybe. It's it could be a yes or no answer if you want. Right. Um, it's, is there any work being done in the belief system? I'm sorry, in the in, in, in beliefs and their effect on creativity. The structure of a belief of an individual. Most of it. Does that, when you start out, you said, I can't design. So that's a belief that someone can't do something. Yes. Great. Therefore, is there any work going on in. Yes, so the interesting thing about the, the formalized term is self-efficacy. This is based on Bandura's work here. The, most of the work is being, currently being done in, in the learning space and education, right? Um, how is it that we actually foster this? There's also, actually, there's also a little work being done in management and organizational behavior in terms of creative self-efficacy. Um, and how is it, what is it that managers can do to support creative behavior in the workplace? So. Um, yes, there is, and the, but what's interesting to me is that this is a point for HCI to make its mark because right now the perspectives are from learning scholars and organizational behaviorists. And I just think given the ubiquity of technology and the way people work, what's our story to tell in this domain? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.